everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Mark McGuinness. Hi Mark. Hi Jo. <laughs> Great to have you on the show. So I'll just introduce you. So Mark McGuinness is a poet, a creative coach, a blogger, speaker and entrepreneur and he is also now an author <laughs> and his, his latest book is called Resilience Facing Down Rejection and Criticism on the Road to Success. So congratulations, Mark, with a new book. Thank you, Joe. It's nice to join the ranks of, of real authors. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. As, as I was saying, you know, you're a poet, so you're kind of above the rest of us, I think. Shucks. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but this, is a, this is a non-fiction book, obviously, about resilience, rejection, criticism. And I wanted to talk to you because... For authors, this is something seriously major that we that we face almost every day. But I wanted to start by asking you, um, I guess maybe you could just tell us a bit about why you can talk about this, a bit more about your background. Yeah, um, well, let's see, for about the last 15, 16 years, I have been in a room, not, not continuously, but I have spent time in a room, one-to-one -one with people. Now, first of all, as a psychotherapist, and then I pretty quickly, actually, I started doing coaching work with writers, with artists, with actors, with creative professionals of all kind. So I've had hundreds of conversations with people about what really goes on between the ears when they sit down and they try to write or paint or act or what goes through their mind before they get up on stage. And, you know, looking back rejection and criticism are two of the, the themes that have loomed largest about why people have come to see me to help deal with this because if you're in any kind of creative profession then you're going to have to deal with those two you know whatever however the you know the whole media landscape changes so i've spent a lot of time listening to people helping them obviously deal with them move forward in spite of that and really that was where the idea for the book came from was Okay, let's see if I can boil this down into a couple of hundred pages. Mm, no, fantastic. So um, why don't we start by defining uh, resilience and why that's kind of what we need. Right. Okay, my definition of resilience is the ability to bounce back from adversity. Now, I want to stress I call it an ability because, you know, any individual listening to this might think, well, I'm, I'm not a particularly resilient person or I see myself as quite resilient. But... When you, you get down to it, it's, there are lots of things you can do to build that ability. And you know, if you see it as just a quality that you have or don't have, then you're, kind of <laughs> you're either lucky or you're not. But once you look at it as an ability, there are things that you can do, specific patterns of thought and behavior and so on, that can help you build that over time. It's a bit like building a muscle. Mm. So that, to me, I think is what you need to counteract all the rejection and criticism that are coming at us for, right. for seven and quite a bit in creative writing career. <laughs> yeah, so, so are you almost saying that rejection and criticism are necessary to creatives? Well, it's kind of hard to, to succeed as a writer or a creative without encountering it, I think. I mean, you could say... Yeah, it would be nice if everything got rejected, uh, accepted first time and then the path was smooth. And I'm sure there are people out there that that's happened to. I'm not quite so sure we could manage without criticism, you know, because I can look back on my own work, well, actually look into the present on my own work. You know, feedback and really high-quality criticism is, is really important of how I improve myself as a writer. So I think maybe it would be nice if we could do without the rejection, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. And um, I would say really good quality criticism is actually very important. Mm. And well, right now I've got my third novel, um, Exodus, out to beta <laughs> readers, and I'm getting starting to get feedback. And what I found is I am so happy for it this time, whereas the first novel I was devastated every time it kind of happened. So is that what you'd call resilience, the ability to take criticism? Yeah, and I think that's quite a good point, actually, because the more, the more times you do this, the more used to it you get. You know, it's like public speaking. The first time any of us does it, we're absolutely terrified. We're up all night learning the lines. We feel like we're being led to execution. But after you've done it 50 times or so, then it's just like, okay, so it's a bigger crowd today. You know, and it's, you're much more relaxed about it. So I think 
you know, what the process you've described is very familiar. In your first novel, it, it feels like life or death, doesn't yeah. it? You know, it's your soul on the line. And then by the third one, actually, you're more of a professional. You know that you've come through unscathed, that the criticism has been helpful. And ultimately, you know, you, you know that you, you can deal with it and, and make the, the book better because of it. Mm, no, absolutely. And what about like, so your book's out there right now, it's starting to get um, reviews on Amazon and it's self-published, right? You self -published. Yes, yeah. yes it is. Yeah. So nowadays, and I was thinking when I was, you know, looking at your title, because rejection is something that I think a lot of authors think of as the traditional publishing process, as in, yeah. Yeah. You, know, you get rejected by an agent or a publisher lots of times and eventually yes. you get picked. Whereas now, like you and I publish on Amazon. So what, what is rejection now, do you think, in this indie world? Well, Joe, you know, I think there are always opportunities in life to be rejected. So, <laughs> even if you're not querying agents and publishers, you know, I and mean, you put stuff out there and it could be, nobody bought it, you know, what's, you know, which is pretty brutal. Or, um, you know, you could send out a review copy and you wouldn't even get a reply. Mm. And so it's, yeah, okay, you, you don't need the rejection in order to kind of get published and get to the races, but you can experience it once you do that. And certainly the criticism in our kind of hyper social media world is that it comes at you thicker and faster than before. I mean, I think you mentioned the one star review on Amazon. Um, there could be the snarky comment on your blog or Twitter or, or whatever. But if you're not careful, it can just throw you off balance for the day. Mm. So, you know, you're in, in some ways that, um, that barrier to publication is gone, so there's not so much. Uh, rejection, but when the barrier is gone, then <laughs> the audience pours in. <laughs> then they, they don't always mince their words. No, so. I totally agree with you. And in fact, that the the one star reviews can often be very damaging to people who haven't built up that resilience. Yeah. I think and and so for me when you've talked about you've talked about rejection and criticism for me the criticism is the things that kind of help us get to the point that stop almost stop rejection or lessen the amount of rejection we might get from an audience that is a really good point actually if you have really good critics before you launch if you have a good editor if you have good beta readers and they say, what about this on page 63? And you go, oh, I'm so glad <laughs> you told me that instead of a review on Amazon. <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah, absolutely. The, the higher quality criticism that you get beforehand and the more you improve, then hopefully the more people are going to like what you put out. Mm. No, that's fantastic. So I was, you know, I was thinking about this from my own perspective. So I, I've, I've got over that initial, I'm a new author and I fear that kind of thing. But I, ha I definitely have a fear of judgment. Um, yeah. When I write certain scenes and things, I worry about what people will think about me as a person when they, when they read it. So yeah. um, that is, is that a common fear? And what do you think about that in terms of how we can get through that? Yeah, it's a very common fear. I mean, first of all, with, with creative people generally, we really identify with the work that we do. It's not just a painting, it's not just a photograph, it's not just a poem, it's a part of us. And Gustav Flaubert put it much more eloquently than, than me. He said, um, he says, we serve up a portion of our gut and then the critics get the knives out, something like that. You know, it was just, <laughs> you know, that's right, he said, a book is organic, a part of ourselves. We serve up piece of gut and then you know so there's that which is just identification with the work itself which which is stage one now for writers it can be even worse than that because depending on the content of what you write then you know you might think gosh I really hope oh, so and so doesn't read that or <laughs> I hope my own you know this certain type of person and maybe as well in writing you some writers will put forward an aspect of themselves that they don't necessarily share, you know, down the pub with friends or with family or in, at work and so on. So that can certainly make that harder. And in terms of dealing with it, I think in one sense, it will get just, even if you do nothing, it should get better. In another sense, you know, it has to hurt a bit. Because if it doesn't hurt, it means you didn't really care about what you put out there. If you ever get to, you know, the point where you're just phoning it in, 
and you don't really have that connection with the work. Well, to me, that's not being particularly creative. So it's kind of the bad news is it's probably always going to hurt a bit, but the good news is it can get better over time. And also, you can do things that mean you don't add to the pain in terms of, so you could get a bad review on Amazon. Okay, well, nobody's going to enjoy that. But if you then spend the rest of the day turning that over and over in your mind and having an imaginary conversation, oh, well, they said that, and I would say this, that, that was absolutely terrible. I can't believe, you know, and you can, there's all this stuff that particularly if you're a writer good at dialogue, I'm guessing, <laughs> that we add to the experience of it. And this is one of the, the reasons in the book why I talk about using mindfulness practice as a way of building resilience. Because what that does, it's very simply just paying attention in the present. You know, it could be a formal meditation practice um, or just, just simply just noticing, okay, well, I had the bad review today, but I'm not reading the review right now. What I'm doing right now is I'm talking to Joe and I can feel the chair I'm sitting in and I can look out the window and see the trees and you know, at this moment life's pretty good. So does that make sense that just having that, just, just stopping the mental tapes running that add to the, the rejection of criticism and make it worse? Mm. And I also, is it, is it sometimes that the fear of something is worse than the actual thing itself? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, that there's so many, I'm thinking particularly presentations, you know, there's so many presentations I gave early on where I was imagining, you know, be a hall full of ogres waiting to eat me. <laughs> and you turn up, and actually, you know, there's probably only one or two ogres. In the but, um, no, it was just a nice usually the reality is better. I mean, you've got to, you've got to anticipate, okay, what if, what if things don't work so well? Your critics will help you with that. But as a general rule, you know, plan, but don't obsess. Mm, no, absolutely. And I like that mindfulness thing as well. Um, I'm one of those people who keeps trying meditation. <laughs> And just, yeah. but I totally appreciate the sitting still for 10 minutes and breathing thing. I just don't do it often enough. <laughs> but why does that help? Like if we do commit to that kind of regular practice, how, how does that actually build up resilience? Well, I think it helps you. I mean, it, is, it isn't a practice where the idea is, to, is to, to, to completely zone out and calm yourself down. It's not like, you know, deep relaxation or anything like that. But it's funny that when you stay in the present, and you're not winding yourself up mentally, you naturally, you are calm. So that's one big benefit. And another one is, you know, when you, I mean, the idea of the practice is that you sit still or you walk up and down if you're doing walking meditation practice, and you just notice what's happening. You notice how you're feeling, you notice what you can see and hear around you, and also you, you observe your thinking. And you can, actually quite interesting, you can watch your mind in action. And you can see, ah, so I'm making myself miserable over because I keep thinking about that conversation I had the other day or that one-star review, or I'm even imagining getting criticized by an audience and I haven't even published the book yet. Mm. So once you start to do that, you kind of start to see through a lot of the little mind games that you're unconsciously playing with yourself. And then you're left to deal with the reality of the situation, which, as we just said, a lot of the time, by no means all, always, but a lot of the time is much better than what you imagine the worst to be. Mm, no, I agree. Okay, so we've talked a bit about their mindfulness, we've talked about facing things. Are there other ways we can build resilience? I think um, a community or a group of like-minded people is a hugely important way of doing that. I mean, it's, you know, I, and I can see it here at the Creative Pen. I mean, one of the great things you do is you share your journey, you share resources and perspectives from other people, like, you know, the conversations in the comments, and, you know, and it's tremendously supportive, you know, that there's a sense of, okay, well, this is new territory, we're all exploring together, you know, self-publishing, the hybrid author model, nobody's quite been here before. Let's help each other along the journey. And, I, you know, and I can tell you're helping build resilience for a lot of your readers and viewers just mm. by that. So one thing I would say is don't go it alone. You know, even even poets like me have support systems. You know, we, I go to this great 
poetry workshop, and it's just for the people who are facing the same issue, the same problem. And that's when you'll get the kind of realization I got from you know spending hundreds of hours coaching people and hearing the same things over and over again. You can get the same realization when you go into a room full of people doing the same thing, which is, ah, oh, there's nothing. It's not me. It's not me personally. There's nothing wrong with me. This is just like an occupational hazard. This is what happens when you try to solve this problem or, you know, write a novel and self-publish it. You will come across similar kind of issues. And once you realize that, it's just like, well, okay, that's not so bad. I can deal with that. That's just a normal thing. There's nothing wrong with me. Mm. No, I, I appreciate that. And I really, I don't think I could have even written one novel without the community that we have online and Twitter and yeah. where you can actually see that other people face the same problems as you do. And that kind of gives you strength, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think particularly writers, are, I don't know, maybe, maybe because I'm a writer, I know how much we suffer. But, um, <laughs> but I think writers are particularly prone to the kind of Garrett mentality that if I'm doing this, I need to be sat there alone at the laptop, and it's you know it's me just just beavering away in the in the in the proverbial garret. But the more I write and the more I read, the more I come to the conclusion that a lot of writing is kind of a group writing project. You know, you, you're you're writing thrillers. Well, there are other thrillers that you know fans of the genre will recognise themes and tropes and and scenarios and. And what they're looking for, that what um, you know is, is, is often most satisfying, isn't oh Joe's done something that completely nobody's ever done this with a thriller before. But it's, it's actually oh you've taken it and you've twisted it, you've taken it in a certain direction, and now that is really pleasing if you understand the genre. So in a sense, you could look at all the other thriller writers as your competitors, or I could look at all the other poets as my competitors. But in a sense, without the others, our work wouldn't make so much sense. Hmm. So. Yeah, no, I see what you mean. And the other thing about resilience, and I really think of it also is in the terms of comparing ourselves to other people, because almost, I'd say probably at least once a week, possibly several times a week, I am comparing myself to other people and finding myself wanting. Mm. Um, and therefore, resilience, like you say, bouncing back almost emotionally to actually sit down and continue writing. Yeah. Well, having a regular writing practice, I think, is hugely important. And also, you know, talking about com comparing, be aware of the effect it's having on you. Because it's one of those things that it can actually be very motivating and encouraging. Mm. But only you will know in the moment, if you're being mindful, <laughs> about the effect. So you can, you can, if you're having a bad day, you can look at, mm. you know, one of the great writers in your field and think, well, what am I doing, you know? How could I compare to them? Mm. And yet, uh, so on a day like that, just stop the comparison. Just just focus on what you're doing and do that to the best of your ability. But, you know, other days, you can look at it and say, okay, well, that's pretty good. But, you know, would Yates be happy with that? <laughs> what would T.S. Eliot say about this? And you, and you think, actually, I'm being a bit lazy today. I need to kind of up the stakes a bit. Because mm. it's so... You know, I think comparisons used carefully, they can help you build resilience because sometimes you think, well, you know what, I'm going to try and push myself a bit harder and I don't mind if I fail at this and it's, it's not, you know, but it, it, I'd rather try to aim for here and then maybe fall down to here mm. and be comfortable about here. Yeah, and I think um, that comes down to risk and tolerance of risk, yeah. and which is something I'm thinking a lot about. You know, as I said, I, my fear of judgment is meaning that I'm writing things under another name right now. Mm -hmm. And um, but if I take a risk in putting myself out there, there will be, you know, pros and cons in terms of the outcome, right? But if we do, if we don't take a risk, we don't get criticised and we don't get you know that. So. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where, is there a sweet spot or we just have to go for it? Well, actually, as I'm listening to you, I'm kind of visualizing a series of kind of chambers. <laughs> and in, in the innermost chamber is where you go in and you're a writer and you say to yourself, if necessary, then you say to yourself, look, what gets written in this room never leaves this room mm. unless I decide that's worth the risk. And I think you have to have that because if you're 
censoring yourself as a writer when you're actually doing it, you're never going to find out. Mm. So I think it's tremendously important to have that space where you, you play, you try new things, you, you take risks, and you realize, hey, I'm not going to stick this up on my website this morning. <laughs> So then the next chamber out from that might be you come back a week later and you reread it and you think, well, you know, is, is, that, is that something I want to take a risk on? Is that something I'd be prepared to show to someone else? And then you might show it to a trusted advisor, you know, a mentor or an editor or, um, you know, somebody in your writing group. Or you might take it to a workshop and see what the response is there. You know, and there you've kind of carefully selected the critics. So it's still risky because they still might laugh <laughs> but, or, you know, they might have a bad reaction. But usually if you select people who know you and know your work, then that kind of contains it a little bit beyond there. And sometimes I'm thinking of my um, poetry teacher in particular, Mimi Kalvati, who's a tremendous, tremendous poet and, and teacher and critic. And one of the things she'll say in a workshop sometimes is, well, you know, if you publish this, there will be some people who say it should be a bit more like this. Mm. So you need to decide whether you're happy to live with that, which I think is quite a wise thing to say, that you, you're never going to please everybody all the time. Mm. And sometimes you think, OK, if I put this out, I know I'm going to get criticised. And you know what? That's probably a good thing. Yeah. So, and that raises a question, how do we know, and this is true of, of critique stuff, like for example, I personally do not believe in the efficacy of critique groups before you have finished your draft, because I think you're, I don't think you necessarily have sorted out your story, that's my personal feeling, so I don't share my writing with other people until I'm happy with it, yeah. um, the whole thing, the whole book, you know, yeah. the, the whole, not each chapter or whatever, so, um, because I guess I'm afraid that the criticism, if I showed as I went along, would change things so much because I would be too susceptible. So how do people know if people do go to a critique group or, you know, how do they know when criticism is valid and when it's not valid? Oh, I see. You mean in terms of the quality of the criticism? Yeah. And I mean, when we get a one star review on Amazon or I mean, th th there's a... There's some things you have to just ignore and some things you actually have to take on board and action, yeah. right? How do you know? Okay, so this is, this is really, I would say, this is a critical point. <laughs> so divide it up into, I mean, we talk about constructive criticism or destructive criticism. You know, good critics, bad critics, or helpful critics and unhelpful critics. So a good critic to me is somebody who knows what they're talking about, but also knows the limits of what they're talking about. So, you know, I might read one of your novels and say, well, you know, Joe, to me, it read like this, but, you know, hey, I'm a poet, so what do I, you know, <laughs> but I would, but then again, if you were being critiqued by a fellow novelist, then they would have a different perspective to share with you. Now, I think a good critic's aware of that. The bad critic just goes in and says, this is rubbish. I hate, it. you know, they've got no, there's not the self-awareness that my judgment isn't the final judgment. So this can be very black and white, very crude. Uh, it's not specific. They don't give examples, or they might judge you by criteria that you think are irrelevant. Mm. Whereas a really good critic will say, well, this is my perspective. This is my criteria. This is what I'm basing my judgment on. And then it, that immediately should let you know whether or not this is a critic you want to listen to. Because if you think, actually, that's not the criteria I've got. You know, if you, somebody comes in and says, you know, you know, they look at one of my poems and say, well, Mark, you know, it's not, you're not going to make much money from this, are you? And just like, well, no, but it's a poem. <laughs> or, I don't like poems that rhyme. Now, to me, that's a ridiculous criterion. So I kind of, I know I'm going to filter that person out. Mm. But if somebody came to me and they said, well, you know, Mark, I love, for example, sonnets. And I do like what you, I just don't think you, you know, you've quite, you know, some of the rhymes here that don't quite work. Well, I'm going to be much more open to that because I think, well, they probably know what they're talking about, or at least we're in the, we've got some criteria in common. Mm. Uh, another thing a really good critic will do is give you very specific examples. You know, I, I like this, you know, and he, here's an example of what I liked or didn't like. And they may even suggest alternatives. Have you thought about this? Could you do that? And supposing you look at it from another perspective. Mm. And... Last but not least, I think a good critic is respectful. You know, I think if you 
are rude or aggressive or insensitive. You know, I, I don't think there's any merit in that. I think criticism is an art, actually, as much as writing in, in some ways. And if you can't do that with respect for the person you're talking to, how, how can there be any kind of meaningful dialogue? So, and it's really important to so the critic. Who might, they're not necessarily going to be your best friend and say, hey, this is great work, when it's not. But they're very clear, there's a problem with the work here. But you always get a sense, I think, with the best critics, that when they, there's a kind of a, an assumption that, and I'm going to trust you as a writer to know how to fix this or how to go to the next stage. Mm. I know you can build on this. I know you can do better, even if this isn't great. Mm. So I think as a writer, you've got to be really sharp. You know, criticize the critic. As soon as you see the one star on Amazon, just go through. You know, is this person giving examples? Are they, um, is it clear what their judgment's based on? Is, is it just black and white? You know, are they abusive or, or, or whatever? And, and that, okay, you, you're never going to completely wipe out the pain of the one star, but at least it gives you a sense of, you know what, that's somebody I don't need to worry about. That's somebody I don't need to listen to. Mm. Whereas if it were a critic who, I don't know, say one of the, the great writers in your field, and they came and they said, you know, this isn't working. And you're probably going to pay a bit more attention to that. Mm. No, I think you're right. And all that you said, we all need to turn that around as well as when we critique other people is to behave in the way that we would oh, want yes. people to treat yes. us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, as well, you know, I think we've got to notice a tendency, it's like, I mean, I used to be a great proofreader, I don't want to blow my own trumpet too much here, but <laughs> I was, a, you know, it just annoys me if there's a, a formatting error or, a, you know, spelling or punctuation error, it kind of jumps at me, it irritates me, and so I know I've, I've got that kind of critical aspect to me, but if I'm, so that means you know, instantly I see a piece of, of writing or something and just like, you, you see stuff and you kind of think, yeah, that looks good, but. Now, don't start with the but when you're talking, you know. So I always try and make an effort to think, okay, well, what is it that I like about this? Because mm. that's, I know that that's going to make a difference. If you can lead in with something that, you know, don't go straight to the but, then, then the recipient is going to relax a bit and get that sense, yeah, you do respect you do understand you do appreciate the good stuff mm. and um I, I would ask everyone right now when they're listening to this in november 2012 um is for nanowrimo novel so i'm i'm yes. a, i've got a nanowrimo novel i've just started and it's not a novel it's a whole load of first draft material that's what i like to call it and then you know you have to be self-critical over it and it's like there's, there's some good stuff but there is some other stuff you know yeah. so th this is an interesting topic because it kind of covers everything from self-critique through you know through beta readers and stuff through to how the audience treat you so i yeah. like that but everything everything you've said to me makes it seem like you have to have a lot of self-knowledge to really look at uh, resilience and all this type, type of thing. Um, what, do, do you think that's true? Do you think really spending time getting to know yourself is probably the number one job? Well, that's why I, I recommend the mindfulness practice. And, you know, by the way, I'm not saying everybody needs to go away to a Zen monastery for three weeks at a time or anything like that. You know, 10 minutes a day can change your life if you do it. Mm. And, but the hardest thing is getting yourself to do it. But once you do that, you know, and there's lots of practical things you can do as well, but mm. that's the place I always start because once you know yourself and you can catch yourself, oh, I'm doing that again, then that's, that's worth its weight in gold, you know, because you can be, you know, we've all had experiences where people told us stuff, you know, you know I've got feedback on performance, uh, you know, certain things I was doing as a presenter, I remember, you know, people would tell me, oh, you know, do this, do that. And then I saw myself on video and it's just like, oh, wow, I really do that, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> so I would say there's, there's no substitute for, for getting to know yourself, just a little bit. You know, it doesn't, you, don't, you don't need to be a Buddha or anything like that. But mm. Just that, that little bit of self-awareness would go a very long way. Fantastic. It, and, it, and also everything else that you do, all the practical stuff, all the going to workshops and getting encouragement and support, and so on, that will be magnified, that will be more effective if you add in that reduction of mindfulness.
That's fantastic. So where can people find you and your book? They can find me at lateralaction.com and the book is lateralaction.com slash resilience. And that's got the links to all the um, Amazon and, and Amazon near you and smash words and all the different formats. So. Brilliant. Well, thanks ever so much for your time, Mark. That was great. My pleasure, Joe. As always, thank you very much.